So we did the theory that you need to think about. Now I'm going to show you example applications. In this lecture, we'll do small molecules, and then in the last lecture, we're going to do big molecules, showing you the power of, uh, of this idea. So uh, I'll introduce you to some imaging applications, some flames, uh, the IR, hypersonic flows. We'll progress through some uh, examples. I like this example right here where we're using infrared camera, and I'll show you the signals that we get when we do that. So planar laser-induced fluorescence uh, was born at Stanford in 1981, 1982. Actually, initially, we called it quantitative imaging. And then uh, the student came up with the idea of planar. So now it's just called PLIF or PLIF. PLIF. You could also you could do this with a single point detector. You can do it with an array detector. But now it's commonly done with a, a CCD array. And it might be an intensified CCD array. So you just expand the laser beam into a sheet. What happens when you expand it into a sheet? The local intensity is lower. Therefore, the signal is going to go down. You always have to keep track of how much energy you have to use. Um, remember, we're, we're interested in fluorescence because we can get spatial resolution. It's simple to think about it if you have a single point detector. If you can do planar laser induced fluorescence, you, you try to achieve a thin, thin sheet of light. It's interesting to think that the pulse lasers that we use tend to be, say, 10 nanoseconds. Light travels at one foot in a nanosecond. So when this laser pulse comes on, it's a sheet of light 10 feet long. It's not uniform in intensity over that length, but that's one way to think about this. And we can form it into a sheet pretty easily. So if we do this, we form it into a sheet, and we look typically at right angles. You don't have to look at right angles, but typically we look at right angles. It's simpler. If you look at different angles, it's a little more complicated. One of these slides plays a movie. I wonder if it's this one here. No, OK. Um, so what if we wanted to do 3D? So in fact, some people would like to do 4D. What if you want to do 3D? Uh, and there's people who are struggling with this question. But we did uh, 3D, I don't know, 25 or 30 years ago. And this simple idea, and I think it's still the best idea. You imagine that you have a, 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 lot, a laser light. Now, this could be a CW beam. It could be a pulse beam. When we did this, it was a, a beam of light that was about a microsecond in duration. And we took this light, and we put it off of a spinning mirror. So we got some sort of a high-speed rotating mirror, and, that that, and the light would come onto this mirror, and that, and that rotating mirror would sweep this beam, the sheet, across the flow of interest. And then we'd use a camera, which we could gate at high speed. And so you take snapshots every 50, microseconds, 50 nanoseconds, say. So you would have a short burst of light, but microseconds in duration, form it into a sheet, sweep it across the flow, and take snapshots like with a high speed camera. That's what we did. And it could be done even better today. There's some alternatives to doing 3D PLIF, but that's the, I, th I think this is the best one. People will try to do tomography to get spatial resolution. But tomography, you have to have lots of beams, the mathematical analysis. And in the end, I think you cannot get the same resolution as a PLF can get. But now you want to keep that resolution. You have to, in order to get high resolution 3D, you've got to have many 2D images. And that's kind of the limitation right now. You need a camera that lets you collect enough of high-resolution 2D images that constitute a 3D image. So you have to d design this. So depending on the pulse length, nowadays, actually, the alternative way to do this would, would be with a burst mode laser. So that you can buy a laser, very expensive. I, I asked someone from a company in the Midwest for a price of their laser, and it was $700,000. So it's kind of impossible. But you can have a laser that would give you uh, a burst of uh, might burst at, say, uh, 100 kilohertz. So you might get a, a, a hundred of these uh, in a thousandth of a second. So now, if there's enough energy in those pulses, you can imagine um, scanning or moving that beam and collecting uh, quite a number of these pulses in a short length. How do you record them? Now you need a camera that collects uh, light at that speed. And that's actually more feasible. You could probably buy that camera for maybe $150,000. So it would be possible to do um, high-resolution 3D now using this concept. What's the problem? 
One problem is that, well, you formed a light into a sheet, so you've just lost local intensity. Now you're going to spread it out into multiple pulses. You've lost some more. So when you, is when you try to go to high speed using modern uh, laser capabilities, it's still a little on the low side for energy. So the images that people get aren't quite as good as they are when you use a single pulse laser, as I'll show you. And what you have, uh, if you did a 3D thing, you, can, you could display this as a cube. You can have a cube of data, and then you can interrogate it from different orientations and angles. And if you do it fast enough, you can play movies. So we did this. Now, what if you're interested? Now, the question is, what parameters are you interested in? What if you're interested in the density of a species, which is a common problem? Maybe you'd like to image OH, CH, formaldehyde, some species. And you're going to measure by your, flu uh, your fluorescent signal. You're going to pick a wavelength that is absorbed by that species and not others. You're going to then collect the light that comes back out in fluorescence. You're going to apply some sort of an equation to try to interpret the signal. Somewhere along the line, you're likely to have to know the Boltzmann fraction of the absorbing state. So that means you either need to know temperature or you have to measure temperature in your experiment. So uh, one way or the other, you can get most of the terms in this equation. Uh, temperature might be a hard one. Q is a hard one. The others are pretty well known. From, you can either measure them or, or they're already known. Uh, one of the techniques that's used to measure the volume is to use Rayleigh scattering. So the Rayleigh scattering is the, um, essentially the elastic scattering. So light comes in and is uh, scattered by the molecules at the same color. So it's elastic scattering. So you can take an image then uh, of the intensity at a point and knowing the amount of power that's going in and the size of the volume that you're illuminating and the number density of the, of the species and solid angle you're collecting, the cross-sections for this process, and then when you do Rayleigh scattering, they, they talk about a cross-section here, a differential cross-section. So you, can, you take something for which the scattering cross-section is known in an environment which is known, temperature and pressure, look at the light that comes out, normalized by the light that went in, and what do you get? You get the volume that you're looking at. So there are ways to get at the volume that you're looking at, oftentimes using Rayleigh scattering. So you can infer, uh, actually, if you do it right, you can get the product of the illumination intensity at that volume and the volume and the angle. So you can get all the terms that you really like to know in one, in one, uh, in one go. Then the signal is proportional to what we'll call a constant times the number density in the absorbing state. So we're getting close to getting to the number density in the absorbing state. And then from there, you need to know the cross section, the, uh, the Boltzmann fraction to get back to the total. So here are some, what are some approximate ways you can proceed? If we write the equation this way, saying that we've determined everything but the Boltzmann fraction, we've written this in terms of a number density in the, of the species times the Boltzmann fraction. So that taken together is the number density in the absorbing state. Now I write this in terms of the mole fraction. And uh, we have a cross, so this is the total number density. Where did I get that? That's from the quenching rate. So you argue that the quench is rate Q is proportional to N sigma C bar. That's the total collision frequency. So now the number density of the species you want divided by the total number density is here. And so this is a relationship between the signal and photons per second. And the quantity you might be after, which is the mole fraction, and the Boltzmann fraction and temperature. So what can you do? If you arrange the Boltzmann fraction to be F of bj of t to be proportional to the square root of t, and if you argue that sigma is a constant, then your signal is proportional to the mole fraction. So that would be like the easiest thing to try to do. Pick a quantum state where the temperature dependence in the numerator is offset by the temperature dependence of the denominator, and now your signal is directly proportional to the mole fraction. Then if you can look somewhere in your image where you know the answer, you've determined everything. That's a fairly common strategy. It's approximate. It's approximate. And we, so you have to kind of test it out. But that's one very simple strategy to get to the species mole fraction. Where is this going to be the easiest? It's going to be easiest in a flow field which has very small variations in temperature and composition across the flow, some sort of mixing flow field. Temperature. Temperature is so important. So what are some strategies? There's a single line method, 
So if we look at this relationship that we derived on an earlier slide, that's proportional to the mole fraction, the Boltzmann fraction, cross-section, that's the cross-section for a collisional quenching collision, the square root of t. What if you pick a tracer for which the mole fraction is fixed? Now the signal is proportional to this. So now you'd like to pick a VJ pair for which this is strongly temperature dependent. So you have kind of a choice. You try to minimize the temperature dependence or you try to maximize the temperature dependence. So if you're interested in mole fraction, you try to minimize the temperature dependence. If you're interested in temperature, using a single excitation wavelength, you could try to maximize the temperature and fix the mole fraction. Oftentimes, though, we can't have a, a uniform mole fraction of the species we want, and so we have to do ratios. So frequently, we'll look at the ratios of the fluorescent signals, which is the ratio of the Boltzmann fractions, and that's how we get temperature. So whether it's absorption or fluorescence, this is a common trick. Use ratios of signals. Now, you have to be careful because these signals have to be taken with the same apparatus, or the, or the response function of the apparatus might be different. But anyway, if you can take the ratio of the signals, you can get the temperature this way, and that's the best way. There, there's some underlying assumptions here that you've assumed that the quench rates are the same in the two states. If, you, if you're careful, that's okay. So we've kind of assumed that the Qs are the same here. All right, so I want to just overview quickly the, uh, really the history of this idea up till the present time. So I've, I've told you that 1981-82, we did the first PLF in flame. I, I'm kind of proud of that. That was on the cover of Applied Optics. My student's name was George Kitchikoff. Uh, a little bit later, we did this an experiment at General Electric Research Laboratory in Schenectady, and we had this picture on the cover of Science. We, this, we call this the duck picture. It looks like a duck. It's a turbulent uh, hydrogen oxygen flame. Uh, I, we, we tried to get cubes of data. So this is a case where we looked at a uh, repetitive forced flow, and we were able to develop a cube of PLIF data that we could then interrogate. That was also on the cover of Applied Optics. Um, that was about 1987. And around 92 or so, we began to use tracers to look at flow. And so my fluid mechanics friends, uh, who were not in combustion, wanted to know whether there was a way to use PLIF in non-reacting flows. In reacting flows, we had been mostly working on OH. OH. Well, there's no OH in their fluid mechanics experiments. So we began to look for tracers which we could use in room temperature gases. And uh, that was uh, what we were doing here, developing a tracer. That particular tracer was uh, biacetyl, which is what's used, uh, was used in uh, the flavoring for popcorn in movie theaters. So it's pretty smelly. We got interested in uh, scramjets around 93, and this was some, a famous uh, result of the first single shot temperature imaging in a model scramjet flow. I'm gonna come back to this. And one of my students was interested in uh, imaging temperature and also velocity in a supersonic jet. This is an underexpanded jet in the PLF images. These were, comp we would interrogate these by different directions to try to get velocity as well as species and temperature. But in the last 15 years or so, uh, this is, the idea now is used around the world in many laboratories, industrial, universities, national labs. And the most recent, what's really changed since 82, 30 years is the cameras that you can now buy. Couldn't buy a camera. We had to build a camera then these days. Now you can buy high-speed cameras. You can buy high-speed lasers. Everything now is quite a bit simpler and faster, much faster. Okay, I want to give you some applications of, uh, looks like I said, I said tracer base, but actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you about OH. This was one of my students, uh, Jerry Seisman, professor at Georgia Tech. I think there's people here from Georgia Tech. Um, and he, he had a xenon chloride, that's an extra laser. Xenon chloride pumped dye laser, which would emit uh, some number of millijoules at some rate and we form this into a sheet, and we would look at some sort of um, um, turbulent flame. This was a methane air flame of some kind. No, a pilot flame. Then he actually was studying hydrogen oxygen. And he could take this sheet, and he could form it in different directions. It could be in a vertical direction, could be in a horizontal direction. 
and so on. So this, these are, this is an old slide. That's the, kind of, the way we made slides in around 1985. But look at these results. These were the results as a function of the Reynolds number from this, um, from this uh, burner. Uh, hydrogen diffusion flame in air, 2.2 millimeter jet, different Reynolds numbers. Instantaneous images. So as you go up in the Reynolds number, the, the flow gets, the flow, the flame begins to lift off and you begin to see lots of detailed structure. People still, even today, I think the images are not much better than this. So this was pretty amazing experiment around 1986 or so. Look at these pretty pictures. Uh, Reynolds number 24,000, look at the structure that we could see in this, um, this turbulent um, diffusion flame. This is one of the horizontal images. You can look at this complicated structure. So what's the power of PLIF? The ability to look at the structure of a flow field. A structure that probably can't be calculated very well even now. But in any case, they, uh, computations and experiments go together. So these computations, uh, experiments drive the computations and vice versa. Oh, I think this is my infrared picture. Okay, so uh, long about, I can't remember exactly when, Brian Kirby is the student at Cornell, came, uh, he was, he's a professor at Cornell, came and he, we, uh, we got some money to try to do infrared imaging. That meant we had to get an infrared camera. So instead of a, a, a visible UV sensitive CCD camera, we had to get a very special detector. It was indium antimonide detector that would respond in the infrared. So we would use, in this case, um, I'm going to show you how the energy level diagram we use two micron excitation. We would look at four, a, a fluorescence at 4.3 microns. And this was a forced flow. I think, I think this is the one that, try this. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, basically this was a flow that was forced acoustically. And what we're looking at is the uh, CO or CO2 that we were in this jet. So you're seeing the mole fraction of jet fluid as it mixes in these, in these vortical structures. And because it was repetitive, we could build up the statistics, we could run a movie. The, the laser was only able to pulse, say, 10 hertz. So these were really uh, uh, an accumulation of snapshots, which also could be formed into a 3D uh, system. That was really, I think, the first infrared fluorescence, uh, certainly the first infrared PLIF that was done. Why do we care? Because we'd like to image CO, CO2, water, and hydrocarbons. You can't do those easily in the EV visible. Although later we found that we could do CO2 at very high temperatures. So the idea is that we could access other species by going to the infrared. Now this is an energy level diagram. This is what we had to understand in order to interpret this. So if we have CO, most of his experiments were done with CO, nitrogen, and CO2. Here's the energy level structure of CO. So that would be the first excited state, V of 1, of CO, uh, V of 2. So if you went from here to here, that would be a fundamental band transition. If you went from here to here to nu, that would be the first overtone. Now, once you absorb, let's say you absorb all the way up to here, he used a laser at 2.3, takes him up to here. What happens to those molecules? They can emit at 4.7 because that's much stronger. That would be a fundamental transition. They can emit to here, but also there's a near resonance between this line and uh, this energy level and this energy level. So a lot of those molecules under, go over here. If the molecules go over here, they're in, in a homogeneous, a heter, a homogeneous nitrogen homonuclear molecule does not emit. So I call that the dark side. So if the molecule comes down to here by emission of light, which is good, goes over here, we lose it. So that means we're transferring out of the collection bandwidth. Or it gets to here and it can transfer over to CO2. CO2 emits, and so we could also see emission. So that was interesting. We realized that if we looked at this, we were looking at light that had been absorbed down to here and then to CO2, which could only happen if the CO molecule and the CO2 molecule collide. So it was a new way to look at mixing, molecular mixing. So this is the way we thought about this in those days. And these processes between vibrational levels are called VV transfer in contrast with the VT transfer that I talked about when we did vibrational relaxation of oxygen. 
So we have an energy level diagram to help you think through the Q that goes into the problem. We have A and Q that we have to keep track of. Here's an energy level diagram of CO2. The CO2 is a little more complicated because it's got um, multiple vibrational modes. Remember, it has four, but two are degenerate. So we have really three different types. Uh, this would be the notation we might use for uh, one quantum of nu one. And this is the Boltzmann distribution of rotations. Here's the bending mode. Remember that's 667 wave number. So that's the lowest uh, state here, zero one. Remember the second number is the next highest symmetric mode, which is the bending mode, which is there. So anyway, we, what we thought realized was uh, if we took a CO2 laser, a high power CO2 laser that someone gave us, and we used it to go undergo absorption, it was actually going to be linking this state and this state. So we could see fluorescence that was driven by absorption from here. But this population is very temperature sensitive. So what Brian found is if we took high temperature CO2, uh, in order to get this signal to take place, he could get some really nice images of high temperature CO2 jets using a very simple CO2 laser that somebody gave us. So this idea works. I want to just compare it with uh, other methods of probing uh, flows. This is a uh, uh, methane flame studied at Stanford and at Yale. Anybody here from Yale? OK. This is not meant to, not meant to be negative about Yale. OK. <laughs> OK. So we would have a, with our, um, our CO2 laser with, with three joules, that's a lot of energy, at 10.6, so it's only going to be sensitive to high temperature CO2. And here's the flame that had been studied for a long time at Yale by um, Marshall Long, a prominent professor in, in um, imaging diagnostics. And basically, we looked at the steady flame, and um, here is our single shot picture of CO2, kind of bad looking. Here's a 36 shot average. Here's the Raman signal from Yale, which you can get by looking at CO2, and here's the CFD. So what you want to do is compare this one and this one, and realize we had to average 36 shots. This took 5,000 shots for each row. So there's something about the relative sensitivity. Let's see if I can use this pointer here. This one might be better. So this is simply reflecting the fact that the Raman signal, which is a different process, sensitive to the species, is a lot weaker. So the cross-section for Raman scattering is low. That's, that's the bottom line. But it's a way to measure some species that are hard to measure other ways. OK, uh, I became interested in scramjets and uh, using our diagnostics in scramjets. Uh, there's a lot of questions about autoignition and flame holding, mixing, opportunities for diagnostics in a laboratory that look at different parts of this problem, uh, as well as in flight. And the question is, well, how do you test uh, these high-speed flows? How do you test beyond Mach 8 on the ground? And people use um, so-called impulse facilities, reflected shock tunnels, and they also use something called an expansion tube. So we built an expansion tube. And an expansion tube is a shock tube with another dimension. So here's the driver part of our shock tube. Here's the driven section of our shock tube. And now here, there is a very thin diaphragm that breaks easily. And this, is the, uh, this section is filled with, a, with helium, typically. This is the gas we care about. So we break the diaphragm. The shock wave comes down here. But instead of reflecting, it, it undergoes a so-called unsteady expansion and flows down this tube to our test section. That unsteady expansion accelerates the gas and gives us the speed that we care about to simulate high-speed flight. And the student who did this, Adela Banyakar, she's now a professor at Texas. Uh, oh, this was our original Imacon camera that we used for uh, 3D imaging. Ultra-fast camera. Uh, it could only take a small number of pictures, but it was uh, it was unique at that time. So we combined PLIF and uh, Schlieren to look in this channel. So at the end of this tube, uh, the gas comes streaming out. And for some short length of time, we have a high-speed wind tunnel. So what did we, I was interested in those days in um, something called a ram accelerator. So it's, anybody here know what a ram accelerator is? Nobody, OK. So the concept was, and it was fostered by the Army and the Navy, 
was that you, um, if you wanted to uh, accelerate a projectile, you might put the, you might shoot the projectile into a tube, into a tube that was filled with combustible gas, and arrange the geometry of the projectile so that you had combustion at the base, which forced the projectile to go faster and faster, called the ram accelerator. Uh, I'm not sure who coined that name. I think it was Professor Abe Hertzberg. So the idea is, is basically instead of having powder and, and uh, having high pressure to push the projectile, you would fill the barrel with combustible gas and arrange for the combustion to be kind of continuous and, and press on the back. So it was an interesting concept. So the idea was you would send a, a projectile down this uh, tube and arrange for the combustion back here to push it forward. And how fast could you go? It turns out they got up to maybe three kilometers per second. Uh, but at those speeds, this thing, they had trouble with the uh, melting. How do you study that in the laboratory? Well, the Army would take some of their gun barrels and uh, put this in there and fire it. But how do you make measurements? How do you measure this flow field? So my idea was, let's fix the projectile and flow the gas. So we put this projectile at the exit of this expansion tube. And here's this gas we care about. And we're going to accelerate it so that it comes out and flows over the projectile to simulate the projectile flowing through the gas. That was the idea. So the virtue of the expansion tube is, well, we can do it on the ground. It's pretty safe. We can accelerate the gas to high velocity. And the gas is never heated to really high temperatures. So all the combustion takes place on this. So in order to understand how our tunnel was working, we did some simple flows. We did, we did flow over a blunted cylinder. And this mixture was a little bit of NO, so we could use NO as the PLIF tracer with some methane and some nitrogen, which this is a mixture that's pretty close to what's of interest to the RAM, RAM accelerator, sometimes called RAMAC. So we had a 19 millimeter diameter blended cylinder. We put it there, and here comes the flow from left to right, and here's the bow shock. Why do we see different color in this flow field? Well, the temperature's varying. So our sense signals are always sensitive to temperature. So we're doing PLIF imaging of nitric oxide in this non-reactive mixture. So this is an image of temperature. And from this, uh, and from this uh, standoff distance or from this shape, we can get uh, calibration of our tunnel. More often, we would actually use a 40 degree wedge. So you take a wedge, well, both of my pointers are dying today. You take a wedge of given angle, and if you know from gas dynamics that there's a relationship between the angle of the wedge, the angle of the shock, and the incoming Mach number. So this is how we determine what is the incident Mach number in this tunnel when we operated it. And we can convince ourselves that we had a velocity of uh, 2,200 meters per second corresponding to a Mach number of seven and so on. So this was a, it was, a, was, a, was a great experiment, really. But we are interested in the case where you have um, detonations. And so we did some imaging where we have, this is now OH plif, not NO plif. And we combine this with Schlieren imaging and we look at certain regimes of where the uh, incoming velocity can be compared with the chapman jugay speed. So if we take a mixture of gases and where we know that the chapman jugay speed, that's the speed of propagation of a self-propagating detonation wave, is at 2,000 meters per second. And we, uh, and we come in with a stream that's bigger than the chapman jugay speed, that means you get a, you're going to get a steady wave, bow shock, and here's the OH. So we're measuring the OH on the cylinder. What happens if we, uh, and if we increase this uh, to a little higher condition, the temperatures are higher, uh, we get a stronger burning zone. But you get a steady bow shock. So look at the power of PLIF to image this, these nice, interesting flow fields. What happens if you drop the free stream of velocity below the chapman gay speed? What you get are these very interesting uh, intermittent oscillations is a detonation, basically, trying to take place in this flow field. So we could study uh, and compare with some calculations by Professor Matsuo in uh, Japan uh, how the uh, temperature and species mole fraction flow field would look for this unsteady detonation flow. So I think that was a, that was a really interesting area for us for a while. Uh, then my student, a new student came along and wanted to uh, use to study scramjets. So now at the exit of that tunnel, we put this uh, plate, flat plate, and we inject hydrogen through a small hole, 
and we have this flow field. And we're going to look at the reacting flow field where there's an underexpanded jet, a mock disk, bow shock, mixing regions, and so on. So we're going to study this flow field. Let's see. OK, this is the Schlieren results first. If you were to look at a textbook of this uh, a picture of this flow field, it would look like this. Here's the Schlieren bow shock. Here's the mixing that's taking place. Here's the, here's the uh, separation zone with mixing taking place here. Some, some mock waves. That's what you would see. But in reality, it turns out that it isn't quite like that. It's unsteady. Let's see if I can get this to play here. So she used this uh, Imacon camera to take images, which we repeat, so it's, it's, uh, it's not exactly correct. But we took these movies, and so this would be a case where we had Mach 3.4, 2,400 meters per second, 1,300 degrees. So the hydrogen is burning. But you're looking at this now with 0.1 microsecond exposures, eight frame movies. And so what you realize is that these, this, uh, this shock wave is not always like this. It's oscillating, a lot of instability. So we began to see the power of using this uh, time resolve technique to study instabilities. This is what the hydrogen, the OH flow field looks like for this case. So we see some, um, some OH here in this boundary layer and in this interrupted uh, surface here. This was Mach 13, 3,200 meters per second. So basically, you're studying a scramjet flow field using OH in an expansion tube. We were a little ahead of our time. Uh, the Air Force wasn't that interested in this yet. So we tore that facility down. Five years later, they became interested, and we built a new one. So uh, and the, we were interested in how this uh, flow field depended upon the jet momentum ratio, which is a fluid mechanics term. We we're interested in where the in a fluid mechanics term. OK, so uh, a little later, uh, maybe five years ago, we came back to this problem, and the person did some, uh, am I doing that time here? OK. This person came back, and um, another person came along and wanted to do the 3D distribution in this flow field. So these are images of, of, uh, of OH at, OK, here's the coordinate system. So um, this is the flat plate down here. Y is the vertical coordinate. Z is the transverse coordinate. X is the axial coordinate. So if we go at different y over d's, y over d of 5, that means with the first image here, Excuse me, the pointer. First image here is taken five jet diameters above. So that's basically corresponding to this plane. Now if we go down to three, uh, one. Now at one, we begin to see the combustion taking place in front of the jet in that boundary layer. Point five. This was amazing. He could get down to, uh, I don't know, a fraction of a millimeter. So this is the distribution of the OH in the boundary layer uh, around this uh, jet of hydrogen. Pretty amazing. Beautiful pictures. So he took pictures from different angles and built up. Uh, this is now, this is the, to get my, let's see if I do this back here. OK. This is the, the, the floor of the tunnel here. This is the, tra the, the side view, and this is the end view. And he's gonna, he built up a 3D display of these things. So basically, he could show you three. Now, he had to get these one shot at a time, so he had to repeat the experiment many times to get these images, because we didn't have a burst mode laser. But you can build a 3D distribution of this thing. Now, I want to move on to, to something that actually came earlier. This was the, the temperature, the student who did the first single shot temperature imaging in the flow like this. This was a the shock tube, the driver of the shock tube, here's the driver, here's the driven section of the shock tube, and here's our jet. And here's the flow field. It's a flow over a uh, 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 step. And so this is, the, that's the cavity, this is basically a cavity flame holder. So here's the hydrogen jet, and it's going to burn here. And we, and we look at this picture far enough away from the end wall that we don't see reflection. And the goal was to use two lasers. This was a very difficult experiment in those days. Two excimer pump dye lasers, frequency doubled, lambda 1, lambda 2 with energy monitor, two cameras, looking at the images. And the goal was to try to measure temperature. So he did this temperature by using two lines of nitric oxide. So the hydrogen is coming in here and turning and going this way. And these are images of temperature, where t cold temperature is blue, high temperature is yellow. 
And uh, there's the backward facing step right there. Here's the bow shock, if you know where to look. Expansion wave. So these were really pretty amazing pictures. And what you begin to see is that the hot yellow now begins, begins to appear in the boundary layer. So you always get combustion in the boundary layer uh, many jet diameters downstream. Now you can do these pictures with, with and without uh, nitric oxide in the stream. So if we take a picture without NO in the free stream, this is a picture of the temperature of the jet fluid. Pretty amazing picture. Single shot, temperature determined to about 50 degrees over this range of 300 to 1400. And uh, basically what did we learn? We learned that the fluid is pretty well mixed by the time you get down here to about 12 to 15 diameters. We have two cameras and two lasers, so he did this for NO to just look at mixing. He did this by looking simultaneously with OH and NO, so this is the fuel. NO represents the fuel. The OH represents the combustion, which, which starts to take place about here in the boundary layer and out here on this edge, and then you can superpose them down here. So those were, that was the state of the art in about that time, which is around 1990 or so. He also did some pictures by looking side on at the end. So there's the picture of what happens if you go downstream at 15 diameters and look back upstream. That's the cross section right here. So if you look at NO, remember NO is representing the fuel. So there's like, it's kind of like a, a circle attached to the wall. The OH reflects the combustion, which is like a ring. So by combining his two cameras, he could take pictures of where the fuel was and where the combustion was taking place. Okay, I think I'm probably running, am I running early? Say 10 to, uh, yeah, am I going as fast as I'm thinking? <laughs> All right, okay, so uh, I think I am. Well, I'll spend more time on the next one. So basically what I'm showing you is that uh, once you get into the laboratory, you can start using PLIF and you can get some useful signals. So you have to learn how to use lasers, cameras, electronics. Uh, there's some very interesting applications in um, subsonic, supersonic, compressible, detonating flows. But what I showed you were measurements of OH and NO. Not all flows have OH and NO, and so you'd like to study some flow fields that are colder. And one way to do that is to use a tracer. And so along the way, we developed some schemes for measuring tracers, and I'll show you that, talk about that historical development and how we'll end up with um, using PLA for temperature using, using, so let's see, I think if I've got my clock right, we're uh, way ahead of schedule, is that right? <laughs> well, maybe you don't mind. Okay, so how about some questions? So PLAF started 30 plus years ago. What's happened since then is that lasers are better, cameras are better, electron. So in, when we did our first PLIF experiment, we had to make the camera, homemade camera. We had to buy an intensifier, buy a photodiode array. Uh, we acquired the images into the computer, single shot. It took 45 minutes to unload the computer onto a pen plot image of, a, of that uh, result. Now, you just sit there blinks on your computer at 10 hertz. That's, that's really the, the advance that's been made in, in, uh, in computers and in cameras. Lasers only recently have gotten faster and better. So the pace of electronics and cameras is, is really amazing. Yes, question? So some of the images you showed in the previous slide, uh, there, are, there are not many quantitative skills. So do you always do the quantitative imaging or you want, uh, sometimes you just care about the quality? Well, so PLIF is, um, people always say, well, it's not quantitative. It's spatially quantitative. It's temporally quantitative. The trick is getting the absolute concentrations. So that's hard. You can get to temperature by taking ratios. Well, but it takes two lasers, typically two cameras. So it's hard to be quant absolute quantitative for a parameter like temperature. We also do the velocity. I didn't show you any velocity. We also did velocity by looking at Doppler shift. And uh, that can be quantitative also. But, so there are tricks to make it quantitative, but that's the hard part. The hardest of all is to get quantitative species mole fraction in a compressible flow. That's the hardest one. So you, nothing's perfect. It's hard to get, you know. Now, what else, else is missing? The turbulence combustion people would very much like you to take images which have very high spatial resolution. 
They'd like you to image down to the chromograph scale. Hard to do. It's hard because you have to, behind all this is an understanding of, you have the size of the pixel and then the size of the region that you're looking at. Thickness of the sheet and so on. So the, there's some questions about optics. What's the smallest size region that you can look at? Recognizing that if you look at a small region that's too small, there's no molecules and so no signal. So there's a lot of trade-offs. So it's, it's especially good for looking at flows with kind of large scale structures. You can look at the structure and say something about the structure. What's hard is to be able to look at turbulent eddies. That, that's kind of beyond what's possible right now. But you learn in, in the first hour, we talked about how do signals, signals vary? How, what's the governing equations? How do they vary with pressure, temperature, and so on? In the end, it's the, usually the uh, quench rate Q that is uncertainty that keeps you from being quantitative about the species. But look at the, what, you know, people like things they think they understand. You see pictures, you like pictures. You, you can interpret pictures. So there's a real power to imaging diagnostics. Line of sight absorption is great. It's quantitative if it's uniform. Quantitative, real-time recording, lots of advantages. Uh, but if it's a complex flow with structure, you need help. You want to see what it looks like. And so you decide what feature you want to see. You want to see where it's mixing. You want to see what the temperature field is. You want to see where it's burning. You want to see where it's burning. Maybe you image uh, CH. If you want to uh, look where it has combusted, you might measure OH. Um, so there's no perfect thing, but still, PLIF is, um, continues to be um, used in many, many places around the world. Are there questions? Yes. Okay, I think I understand your question. So that goes back to uh, if you understand the species that might be present, you can ask, um, what is their absorption spectrum? And can I pick a place where I can excite only one species? Then you can use your understanding of spectroscopy to predict the emission spectrum and decide where to put your filter. So you can usually separate the signals from different species. The one exception was when we do the infrared, you have transfer between molecules. Now it's a little more complicated. You're getting emission from different species. You have absorption from only one, but emission from different ones. So usually that's not a big problem. The problem is if you want to measure, say, 10 ppm of NO in the presence of, we did this problem, there was interest in uh, measuring in imaging NO in a high pressure flame that was uh, um, fueling. So that meant there's a lot of oxygen, high temperature, CO2, and, and, uh, and a little teeny bit of NO. So there's the problem. You want to measure NO uh, in the UV, but oxygen has an absorption spectrum in the same region. So we could never find a place where the NO lines were completely separated from oxygen. So that's a problem. It happens when the species you're interested in is a minor species. And when we were trying to unravel that, we found out that there was CO2 that we hadn't understood before. So that's a problem. It, it, it's easiest if you measure the thing that's, that's big. It's, it's hard if you're trying to measure tracer, minor species. That's for sure. Well, there's always a limit, and you just have to find out what it is. So you want, if you understand the possible choices of the method, if you understand what you're after, you look at the choices, and you always read the literature to see what somebody else has done because you can save time. If you're just going to copy what they did, that's nice. If you have to invent something new, it's an uncertainty. But uh, what is this? This is spatially resolved absorption. It's powerful. Yes? Is it possible to use this system to measure flame-stable filaments? Flame? Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So typically, yeah, so we, you can do a time, res yeah, you can look for blow-off phenomena, yeah, yeah. So especially if you're just looking for structure. So in fact, we, the series that I showed you that were taken a long time ago by Jerry Seisman, as we cranked up the Reynolds number, the, you know, we just, we see the flame blow off, 
look at the structure change. So that's a pretty common thing to do, is to look for the structural changes as a function of, say, Reynolds number, and so on. There was another question here somewhere. Yes? Um, for measuring temperature, when, you're, when we're talking about um, using two lines to figure out the temperature, we know that it is because of the, because of the distribution of particles of mm -hmm. different stages. But when you use a laser, aren't you kind of messing with the distribution? Okay. And additionally, some of those particles that are excited are also potentially going to um, heat up the gas. Yes, okay, good question. So there's two issues there. One, do you distort what you're measuring? That's basically this is the same question. If you send in a lot of laser light, are you just actually changing what you're trying to measure? So the first thing you say is, well, I'll avoid that problem by using the smallest, I'll keep, by keeping the laser energy low. So you, you, you have to worry about this. Uh, am I heating, the, okay, it's a very good question, because first of all, am I distorting it? If I had a chamber that was closed, static, and I send in laser light. I could have asked the same question about absorption. If you send in light and, and, the, and the energy is uh, absorbed, where does it go? Well, if it's re-emitted, it can maybe leave your chamber. But if it's, if it's quenched, it's heat. If the uh, quantum yield is um, 10 to the minus 4, only 1 in 10 to the 4th of those absorbed photons get out as photons and maybe leave your experiment. What happened to the rest of them? That quenching collision converts that energy of the molecule into heat. So in fact, therefore, there is a relationship between the heating you do to the flow and the energy that you've deposited. So if you only deposit a little bit of energy, then you haven't changed the flow field. If it's moving pretty fast, good. You're not going to hit the same gas twice. But that's a good question. You have to avoid uh, disturbing the thing you're trying to measure. If you do saturation, you are in fact disturbing intentionally what you measure. But you hope that in the single pulse you do this, and then the new sample comes by. So yeah, that's an issue. Um, so sometimes you have to ask this. First of all, of course, you have to have signal. So you have to crank up the laser power to get signal. Then you have to ask, am I using too much? So it depends on the situation. Uh, when we're doing absorption, usually the laser power is milliwatts, Gas is moving, it's negligible. But you can do a simple calculation. You're, you're dumping so much energy in a certain volume, does that change the temperature? Or maybe it, it uh, wants to change the temperature, but you don't repeat the experiment until a new sample has come by. So it depends on whether it's moving also. Yeah, that's right. So you have to worry about interference uh, absorption, interfering emission. So in a fluorescence, ex in a fluorescence experiment, you, you collect light from some spectral band. Some of that light is from the thing you're trying to study, but there's also emission from this flame. How do you solve that problem? Usually you do that by time gating. So you always use uh, spatial filtering, spectral filtering, time gating. So you put a spectral filter in front of your detector so you only look in a narrow place where your signal is. That means you block everything else, spectral filter. The other thing you can do is you have a pulse of light, and you know that your signal is going to be confined to one microsecond. In the two-line temperature images I showed you, uh, the quench rate, the, the, the uh, decay rate was about 200 nanoseconds. So we sent in 10 nanoseconds excitation. The fluorescence decayed in 200 nanoseconds, and we, and we stopped collecting light. So you, you confine your attention to the time in which your signal is present. That's time gating. So you use time gating, spectral filtering, use all the tricks you can. You know, and you have to check, are these problems or not? So there's interferences from other species, interferences from both in absorption and also from, uh, from the emission. Yeah, there's always a problem. Usually what happens is your experiment is working pretty well and you want to push it to some limit. Higher temperature, higher speed, lower. And that's when you usually run into trouble, and you have to ask, what's keeping me from going further? You know, what's keeping me from going further? Maybe I want to look at shorter times or lower concentrations. So that's when you have to understand things. It's what, what's keeping me from going, pushing the boundaries of what I'm able to do. More questions? <laughs>
All right, we have only one hour left, 50 minutes an hour. And so what I want to do next is I want to show you that um, we can use these same tools in some non-reactive flows. So I was inspired when I saw a fluid mechanics movie. Some people were calculating the, some, a flow field, a mixing flow field. Uh, they're fluid mechanics people calculating a flow field, showing movies of the time evolution of some structures. And I realized that's what they care about. So we have to find a way to take images of flows. They didn't want combustion. They, they wanted to study mixing 3D jets and stuff. So that led us to this idea of using flow tracers. And that's what I'll talk about next time, the, the, the use of uh, flow tracers in PLIF. Yeah, there's another question? OK, so we're about on time. So I guess we start at 11.15, and we'll be done by 12.15. OK, thank you.